Chicago, you can always rely on defense. And we love defense. And the simple fact is, we like the brutality of football. We like players saying, I'm not just going to tackle that guy, I'm going to kill him. There's a part of us that's saying, hey, we got winter coming. We've got blizzards on the way. Lake Michigan is frozen solid. Well, how about we inflict a little pain on people who come here to visit? Well, Chicago was always an intimidating team. George Hallis was up there. They always came out in those black uniforms. They looked bigger, stronger, and faster than you were. No question about it, but they intimidated you. They really did. Hallis was the greatest at it. From George Hallis to Brian Urlacher, we'll break down the great Chicago Bear defenders and announce our all-time starting 11. The defense has always been expected to play well in Chicago. Obviously, the 85 Bears set a standard, but the 63 Bears defense was as, was as dominant for the, at the time. And, and, the, and the defense has since. They went to the Super Bowl three years ago, and the, and the defense carried it. I, I think the city likes it. The city expects it. Nah, so I don't think it'll ever change. Every story about the Chicago Bears begins with George Hallis. And a discussion of the franchise's greatest defensive players is no different. The team's founder also played defensive end. He once forced a fumble and returned it 98 yards for a touchdown. Tackle Ed Healy was part of the first player sale in NFL history when Hallis bought his rights in 1922. Healy was an all-league pick five times in his first five years in Chicago and was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1964. Many people called Hall of Fame end Bill Hewitt the greatest two-way player in NFL history. Opponents called Hewitt something else. Bill Hewitt was a great player, really was uh, no more for his speed. In fact, uh, they used to call him Offsides Bill because he was so fast, they always thought he was offsides. But the first defensive end to gain fanfare for his pass rushing abilities was Ed Sprinkle. He had an article, I think it was in Look Magazine, the meanest man in football. Other players thought he was a he he dirty player. And his trademark was the clothesline tackle, you know. Running backs would come around then, and he that's, that's been outlawed. Nicknamed the Claw, Sprinkle was more than willing to add to his intimidating reputation. Someone once asked George Blanda what he liked best about playing for the Chicago Bears, and he said, well, what I like best about playing for Chicago is that I don't have to play against Ed Sprinkle. <laughs> we were playing Green Bay, and they had a, a in from Michigan who was a very elusive end and he played offensive left end and and he had a little mustache and and Hallis says I'll give you five dollars for every hair that you pull out of this guy's mustache see and they said that I they ran a play and I come running off the field holding my hand and started counting he weighed 207 pounds now today he'd be at what would he be a safety? Yeah. You know he weighed 207 pounds, and he was this physical, you know, killer presence. Jim Smith punched from his own five. Ed Sprinkle charges in, blocks the kick, and Chicago's Whiteman recovers in the end zone for the fourth bear tally. He was a great player, but uh, unfortunately, just didn't get the publicity that uh, should put him in the Hall of Fame. In 1955. Chicago acquired a player whose toughness and talent earn him a spot on our starting 11. Defensive end, Doug Atkins. One time I was at uh, the Hall of Fame and I got to have lunch with a bunch of Hall of Famers. There were about eight guys at the table. They talked about one person for 45 minutes, Doug Atkins. It was amazing to me, the, the, the legends were talking about one particular legend. So he was, he was he was 
clearly a legend among legends, which is fascinating to me. At six foot eight, 275 pounds, he's the largest member of the Hall of Fame. And a whole generation of pro football players will tell you that Doug Atkins is definitely more muscle than myth. The guy was 6'8", 280 pounds of just all muscle. He could high jump seven feet. He could beat you any way he wanted to beat you. First play of the game, we had a 220-pound left tackle named Grady Alderman. He picked Alderman, picked him up off his feet and threw him right at our quarterback. Just threw him about 10 yards through the air. My first recollection of Doug Atkins was when um, we played the Bears in an exhibition game in 1965, and Skaronsky was offensive captain, and I really looked up to him. So when he came to me before the game, he said, look, here's some things I want you to remember. Number 81 is Doug Atkins. He's 6'9", he weighs 265 pounds. He said, uh, don't cut him, and if he falls down, you help him up and say, nice play, Mr. Atkins. Well, I started to laugh, and Skaronsky said, kid, this is not a joke. And I'm not kidding you now, because if you cut him on his knees, the first thing he's going to do is kill you, and then he's going to kill me. Atkins' intimidating size and demeanor, combined with his talent and athleticism, made him one of the best defensive ends in NFL history. Atkins made the Pro Bowl eight times and was first team All-NFL in 1963 when he led the Bears to the NFL Championship. We had Doug Atkins, and Doug was the best football player I've ever seen. Uh, nobody could block Doug by themselves. The best defense in the league has done it again and made the Bears the world champions. Atkins was known as a free spirit. He was also known to butt heads with Bears coach George Hallis. We were breaking camp this particular night. We've been out tooting it up a little bit. I thought I'd play Coach Hallis a little music, and I turned that music up just loud as I could get it. Oh, he'd come out of there cussing, boy, oh, damn stupid hillbilly, this, that, and other. We had a big fight right in the hall there. I, th I think he'd swing it. If you'd hit him, I think he'd swung back, because he, he was awful aggressive. And had, I looked down the hall and see everybody's heads be peeping out. <laughs> he was probably the only guy that, that uh, had enough guts to battle George Hallis, because uh, Doug was, uh, you know, he was a tough guy. Uh, you just always felt like the best thing to do was just to say, Doug, go get the quarterback. <laughs> That's what Atkins did, leaving his mark on the game as one of the most feared and respected players in NFL history. If you wore the opposing team's uniform, you were in big, big trouble because Doug Atkins was going to get to that quarterback and was going to get to that running back. This guy is going to get down as one of the greatest defensive ends in NFL history. The legacy of Bears linemen continued in the 1970s with players like defensive end Mike Hartenstein and defensive tackle Jim Osborne. Jim Osborne, he was a great player. He could rush the passer, play the run, but not quite as spectacular maybe as a Hampton or, or a Chambers. In 1973, the Bears selected Wally Chambers with the eighth overall pick. He paid immediate dividends. Wally Chambers was probably the most athletic tackle uh, I can ever remember the Bears having. Great quickness and could dominate a game uh, by himself. In his first four seasons in Chicago, Chambers made three Pro Bowls won the Rookie of the Year in 1973 and was named the NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 1976. Wally Chambers, the Bears have a player who could be the premier defensive tackle in professional football. He might have been the best ever, but, but he only played four years and he got hurt. He, he, he was so long-legged they got to his knees. Chambers started only one game in 1977 before injuring his knee. Before the next season, Chicago traded Chambers to Tampa Bay for the fourth pick in the 1979 draft. With that pick, Chicago selected the next member of our starting 11. Chicago Bears first round selection. Dan Hampton, defensive tackle, Arkansas. We got Hamp, uh, you know, you knew he was going to be a great one. He'll be a Hall of Famer. Dan Hampton did not waste any time making his mark on the NFL. He started 16 games in his rookie year and made the Pro Bowl in his second. 
Dan Hampton, uh, one of the best football players I've ever seen play. Uh, just a big, physical, intimidating presence in the middle of the line who could not be blocked. At six foot five and 264 pounds, Hampton was a versatile player. He made two Pro Bowls as a defensive end and two as a defensive tackle. Nicknamed the Danimo for his aggressive play, Hampton was also known as a leader and a selfless teammate. I think the defensive players were real close to each other. I mean, a lot of my best friends are on the defensive line and the linebackers, and we spend a lot of time together, and we uh, more or less have a real team concept here, and I think that's important. Hampton knew John Wayne. When Hampton shows up, uh, something great's going to happen. When you go into war with Hamp, that's, that's great, because if he can walk, he's going to play it, and he'll make great plays. The Interproc, under pressure, he was really, to me, the key to the 46 defense because he created the havoc in the middle of the field that allowed others to make the plays. He was the guy who absorbed all the double teams and who, who I think really most offensive coaches game plan for. Hampton had nine sacks or more in a season five times. And he was named to the All-NFL team of the 1980s. I think Dan Hampton, although he hurt, hurt his knees, he was unblockable and really tough as a tackle. In 2002, he was elected to the Hall of Fame. And even in Canton, he was thinking about his teammates. Leave here today, and I go back over and I walk into that sacred ground. I'm thinking about everyone I played from high school to college to Chicago. Like I said, today you know why I've never walked alone. Dan Hampton was just, uh, willing to sacrifice uh, his body and his mind for the success of a team. Dan Hampton was symbolic of what being a Bear is all about. The man who played alongside Hampton for nine seasons will also play alongside him on our starting 11. Defensive tackle, Steve McMichael. When I walked out the tunnel, not too much mattered to me. I didn't, you know, that was all superficial. The mechanism is cleared, tunnel vision. Here's where I want to do, and this is where I want to go. And nobody's going to stop me from that. Steve McMichael, he's a very deranged, very unstable person. Nobody was tougher than McMichael, who was like a guy who who uh, hunted rattlesnakes barehanded. Steve McMichael, to me, was the embodiment of the tough Bears defenses of the mid-80s. Uh, he was the most consistent, most durable, uh, most try-hard guy you'd ever find in your life. Despite being selected in the third round, McMichael didn't even last a half a season in New England. Got him from uh, New England Patriots. Uh, they, uh, we wanted to make a center out of him, but uh, when I saw his uh, personality, I knew that he'd be a great defensive player. McMichael would be great, making two Pro Bowls, recording 92 and a half sacks, and being the all-time Bears leader in games played. But he still went unnoticed at times because he played alongside other greats. That's often the case in a lot of teams. You have one good player, there's usually two. If you look closely enough, one might be more famous, but the reason he's famous and the reason he's good is he's got a sidekick. Our defense was me and Hampton in the middle and Richard Dean in the end. All the other defenses had two great ends and one defensive tackle, not two. Walker, the long back, inside the 15, Wilson back to the middle, throws the right side, the ball kicked in the air, intercepted, the man who kicked it was Steve McMichael! Steve McMichael was, in a lot of ways, I think, the heart of the defense. So obviously he was, he was a big part of everything the Bears accomplished in the 80s. Playing with arguably the two best tackles in Bears history did help improve the game of William Perry. Perry still will always be known for his touchdown runs, even though he had just five carries in 1985 and just eight carries in his career. That's not what I remember William Perry for. Uh, he did such a great job of clogging things up that allowed everybody else to go more. He took up a man and a half space, not just by being there, but he was quick in a five-yard area. Although he gained a lot of notoriety during his rookie season, 
Fridge proved he wasn't a flash in the pan, becoming a solid defensive tackle for eight more years. Perry wasn't the only popular defensive lineman to moonlight on offense. Defensive tackle Jim Flanagan had 11 sacks in 1995. Flanagan also caught four passes in his career, all for touchdowns. Dreamer takes, makes the handoff, pops the right side of the end zone. Touchdown! Flanagan! Jim Flanagan on the touchdown! Current defensive tackle Tommy Harris does not play offense, although he does spend a lot of time in the opponent's backfield. Tommy Harris is the key to uh, the Bears' current defense that they play at the three technique tackle. Uh, he has that great first step, explosive first step. Without Tommy Harris, uh, the Bears' Tampa 2 scheme really doesn't work. Harris, the 14th overall pick in the 2004 draft, has made the Pro Bowl three times in his first four years. Quick hitter, oh, 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 Tommy Harris knocked it out. Bears have it. What a play. Harris's teammate, Adewale Agunlie, had 35 and a half sacks in his first five seasons in Chicago. And down he goes, Adewale Agunlie. Adewale has all those techniques that a defensive lineman needs. And there's times in games he can be an absolutely spectacular player. But Agunlie has a long way to go to match the sack totals of the final member of our starting defensive line, Richard Dutt. In 1983, Bill Tobin was the director of scouting. Tobin loved Richard Dent. He played at a small school. Nobody knew about him. They didn't know his potential. Richard Dent was, yeah, that was like a diamond in the rough. Of course, when we got him, he was 235 pounds. Very undersized. No one thought much of him. He was an eighth round draft pick. And uh, the problem had been up to that point is that he had poor dental work. That's why he was so undersized. And once he, he, when he got to the Bears, he got his teeth fixed. And he, uh, he, he instantly put on weight and became this monster football player. And down he goes. A loss of Fast and aggressive, Richard Dent blossomed from the 203rd pick in the draft into the best pass rusher the Bears ever had. Dent reached double digit numbers in sacks eight times, and his 124 and a half sacks put him atop the Bears' career list. Richard Dent was a guy who his speed coming around the end was really kind of rivaled only by somebody like Lawrence Taylor. I mean, he was quicker than a cat. I mean, he, he could come off that ball. He was unbelievable. I mean, I mean, the tackle had to be really on his toes to get his hands on him. In 1985, Dent had one of the best seasons ever for a defensive player. He led the NFL with 17 sacks, was named first team All-Pro, and helped the Bears win the Super Bowl, where he was named MVP. He became a real force. I mean, he never lost the quickness, but he had all that power and strength to go with it. Should be a Hall of Famer, don't know why he isn't. If you look at a pass rusher that was able to dominate stretches of the football game for the most dominant defense you know, ever, the 85 Bears, Richard Dent deserves his shot and, and his place in the Hall of Fame too. Richard Dent was a key member of one of the greatest defensive schemes in NFL history, Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. A 46 defense be a defense that was created because all the linebackers were hurt. And as it evolved, it is all about pressure. If you stop a passing game, uh, you can't stop it unless you put pressure on it. Now, some people are good enough to put it on with a three-man rush, but well, we're not. Back down the road, we're good enough to put it on with a four-man rush. If we have to send eight, we'll send eight. But we're not going to let you sit back there and pick us apart. We're going to put 11 guys on the field, and we're going to come at you from all different directions, and we're not going to stop. And we're going to hit your quarterback until you get another one in. But we're going to keep coming, and we're going to keep you guessing, and we're going to keep you thinking. We had, at every position, aggressive players, and they were smart. They were experienced. Buddy used to always say, young rhymes with dumb. We do have intelligent players, and we do ask them to use their brain as well as their brawn, and they like it because when they go somewhere else and they tell them just to do it harder, they know there's a more intelligent way to approach the situation, and we try to give them that situation and let them use their intelligence. 
and you know offensive coaches they like to think they're good they run people all the field and put them in motion and do all this and they want you to stand over and let them do what they want to they don't like it when you don't <laughs> the thing that we wanted to do and the 46 allowed us to do was um, really audible and when we went out there and the offense were trying to set us up for, for plays or whatever that they really wanted to run uh, and the, the quarterback would audible and I would audible and put us back where we were before. In 1985, the Bears boasted one of the best defensive units ever assembled. They led the league in points allowed, holding opponents to 10 or less 11 times in 16 games, and were first in takeaways with 54, or nearly three and a half per game. They were a cocky, uh, arrogant, they'd tell you what they're gonna do to you, and as long as they did it, uh, you know, I didn't consider that bragging. I've never seen the team 15 and one talk so much, you know? As dominant as they were in the regular season, they were even better in the playoffs. First, they shut out the Giants. Then the Rams. In Super Bowl XX, they forced six turnovers, allowed just seven rushing yards, 123 total yards, and scored twice. has been incredible. <laughs> they knock your socks off just to watch it. Total decimation to the AFC champion New England Patriots. We had so much <laughs> passion for the game and so much pride in what we did. Uh, it's rare that you get a group of guys together. I, I can't think of anybody that wants to win more than Otis Wilson. I can't think of anybody that wants to be the best more than Dan Hampton. I can't think of anybody that, that wants to go to the Super Bowl more than Gary Fensick. I can't think of anybody that wants to be dominant more than Wilbur Marshall. I can't think of anybody that wants to come off the ball like Richard Denton and get to the quarterback every down. Can't think of anybody like Steve McMichael. Can't think of anybody like Fred. I can't think of anybody like that. The 1985 Bears defense is considered one of the best of all time. But while fans can name their front seven by heart, it becomes tougher for some to identify the members of the secondary. And Dieter Brock back to throw, looking right now, looks over the middle, he pops it up. Yeah. Intercepted by Les The secondary didn't get its due, but they were all part of this thing too. You can't take them out of it. Their corners never got a whole lot of publicity. They had to cover people man on man. You know, playing man to man coverage as much as we did with our 46 defense, it, it, those guys had it covered pretty well. I think it took a bizarre, genius type disconnect from reality to think you could do this. Because you're very vulnerable when you do that. Because that wide receiver, if he gets past our corners, he's gone. Well, the 46, you have to say, you cornerbacks are going to be so good for the first 10 yards on, on the wide receivers that no quarterback's going to have a chance to throw. The Bears' best corner in 1985 was Leslie Frazier, who started every game and led the team with six interceptions. Les Frazier is good at cover corners ever played in those years. Frazier had 20 interceptions in his first 65 games as a Bear. But on the biggest stage, Frazier's career came to an unceremonious end. Les Fraser was on his way to a stupendous career. He actually hurt his knee very, very badly in the Super Bowl, getting ready to return a punt on a reverse, I think. Reverse, he hands it off to Frazier, who cuts to his left across the 50, and Frazier is covered up. Oh boy, Leslie Les Frazier is down. down to the field. 
So unfortunately, Les Frazier hurt himself very badly, and that, that pretty much ham hampered his career forever. But he was on his en route to being an absolutely spectacular cornerback. Leslie Frazier was a good corner. Mike Richardson was a real good corner. Both had long arms, and they could, they could bump you, and that's what, the way they played. Mike Richardson, a second-round pick in 1983, blossomed into a solid cornerback two years later. Mike Richardson was a safety in college. And we came on, we, we, we watched him play, and uh, we were pretty strong at the safety position. So we played him a corner, he had pretty good feet, made some great plays, had a great ability to read the quarterback and break on the ball. Intercepted by Richardson. Touchdown, Mike Richardson and the Chicago Bears! Mike was a good kid. Richardson played six seasons with the Bears and finished with 20 interceptions. The man taken one round after him in 1983 was safety Dave Dewerson who got his chance to start after Pro Bowl safety Todd Bell sat out the entire 1985 season due to a contract dispute. Dave Dewerson was a guy who got his opportunity and he made the most of it. Once he got on the field, the Bears couldn't take him off. Cutting right to the 45, offended by Dave Dewerson. Made a lot of tackles, did not make a lot of mistakes, and was a leader in the secondary. Dewerson had five interceptions in 1985 and made the first of his four Pro Bowl appearances. Dewerson could blitz and cover. In 1986, he had seven sacks and six interceptions. Dave was a heady guy, a smart guy back there, who not only could play the run, but play the pass, and, and, and we needed that. He complimented Les Frazier and Mike Richardson very well. That secondary was pretty darn good. The man who led the Chicago secondary in 1985 is also the man we chose as a starting safety on our all-time Bears defense, number 45, Gary Fensick. Gary was as, as smart a player to ever play the game in the secondary. Fensick was a wide receiver at Yale and was drafted in the 10th round by the Dolphins in 1976. After getting cut by Miami, Fancic landed with his hometown Bears as a defensive back. You know, they always talk about in the NFL, don't get injured because your backup may never get out of there. And I, I was one of those people. I mean, Doug Plank got injured. Uh, I became a starter. Uh, he came back after four games, and I replaced Craig Clemens, who was the number one pick. Fancic became their starting strong safety. And for the next 10 years, he was a fixture in Chicago's secondary. Gary Fensick was a football player. He was smart, he was tough, he was opportunistic, he could tackle, he could tackle, and he was willing to, you know, to sacrifice his body. He was willing to put a lick on a guy. You might have 70 defensive plays in a game. Every single play, you hope that you have the lick of your life. That you can come in after lifting weights for six months and crush that person help him up and go, that was a great hit, you know, and see that film and, and have your teammates go, that was awesome, you know. Fensick's hard hitting, combined with his athleticism and nose for the football, made him a perfect catalyst for Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. Off the middle and he's cut down once again, and Gary Fensick leading the charge for Chicago. Mike really was the leader up front, called, and then Gary set the defensive backs and everything, got everybody in place, so he was our leader in the secondary. Fensick made two Pro Bowls and finished his career as Chicago's all-time leader in interceptions with 38. A Chicago native, Fensick still lives in Chicago and roots for the Bears every week. I actually put in my last contract with the Bears 20 years ago that if the Bears ever built a new stadium, that I'd have the right to buy four seats between the 40-yard line. And uh, the Bears honored that. Another member of the 1985 Bears was safety Sean Gale, who played sparingly in 85, but was part of one of the year's most memorable plays. Vendetta from his end zone. Bears will get good field position. Oh, he oh, missed this! This is the football! He missed! He missed! The field. Oh, it's Sean Gale! I've never seen a punt Talk miss so pretty amazing how the wind just took it and uh, the next thing I know Sean Gale had it in the end zone. Gale would not become a full-time starter until 1989 but when he did 
he forged out the reputation of being a tough player. Sean Gale, even though he didn't look like it was as tough as they got, he played one game, he actually had a, uh, a broken neck and he, he lost feeling in his hands. He kept playing. I mean, absolutely stunning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true story. Gale, who made the Pro Bowl in 1991, is currently third on the team's all-time tackle list. In 1990, the Bears used the sixth pick to draft a player who would have one of the best rookie seasons in NFL history. The uh, Chicago Bears select Mark Carrier, defensive back, USC. I've only experienced one rookie that's been that mature coming out that early in my 18 years in this league. Mark Carrier came in and started immediately on a very formidable defense. Yeah, what, a, what a presence Mark Carrier in just his rookie year has had on this secondary. And he has assumed and become a leader on this team at a very young age. He started as a free safety, made all the signal calls for the back end. Was not intimidated from day one. Deep down the middle, going for Clark, and it's yeah! We knew right away, not only the coaches, but the vets too said, this kid's going to be special. Testaverde in the pocket, scrambling left. Testaverde looking to make a play. Throws the left side. Intercepted into the play by Mark Carrier. He sets a bear record with that interception. Make it 10 interceptions. Even with the Singletaries, the Dents, uh, the Hamptons, those people that were on that football team, uh, Mark Carrier was, was savvy enough, mature enough, confident enough in his abilities and came in, intercepted 10 passes his rookie year, went to the Pro Bowl, and went on to have a, you know, a Pro Bowl career. You know, wasn't the biggest guy, wasn't the fastest guy, but what you had there was a pure football player, just a pure defensive football player. Mark Carrier made three Pro Bowls in his seven seasons in Chicago, but he will always be remembered for his stellar rookie campaign. Safety Mike Brown will be remembered for being the most opportunistic player in Chicago Bears history. Mike Brown had the ability, it seemed, to make those kinds of dynamic, game-changing plays, certainly not with regularity, but enough that it was more than just, oh, he was lucky to be there. Brown played nine years for the Bears, tallying 17 interceptions, seven fumble recoveries, and seven defensive touchdowns, a Bear record. Mike Brown must score every time he touches the football, basically. Jeff Blake from the shotgun. Swipe. Oh, and it's intercepted. Picked up and going to the goal line. Touchdown, Mike Brown. Brown on the run back in the 30. 20. He's got an escort to the 10. 5. Mike Brown has done it again. Matt goes back to throw. Hit from behind. Smart gets it. Ball is bouncing around. Picked up on one hop. We got a touchdown, Chicago. Touchdown, Mike Brown. Brown's most memorable moments came during back-to-back -back games in 2001. Maybe the most interesting thing about those two games is the fact that for the first time in NFL history, I believe they were won exactly the same way, exactly the same player in overtime two weeks in a row. Short set, quick throw, slant. Oh! And it's gonna be a Right place, right time. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it, baby? From 2004 to 2007, Brown missed 43 regular season games due to injury. Mike Brown was a really good football player whose career, unfortunately, at a high level, was cut short due to injury. Brown had the pleasure of playing with two other really good football players, cornerbacks Charles Tillman and Nathan Vasher. So right here's where you go get it at today. Tillman had been a starter since his rookie season and has recorded 16 interceptions from 2005 to 2008. Pick up! It's over! Tillman! It's over! Charles Tillman! Pick six! That's the end of the game. Bears win it! 19-13! Like Tillman, Basher can be physical and a playmaker. And it's 
It's intercepted by Nathan Fetcher. Picks up and goes. He's got an escort down the right sideline. Nathan Fetcher, touchdown. Touchdown Bears. And a mighty big one at that. That's it right there. That way to play big. That's it good. Vasher burst onto the scene with 16 interceptions in his first three years as a Bear. The interceptor, they call him. Uh, he's a guy who's too slow to play in the National Football League. But all he does is find the football. Ball stripped out, it's bouncing around and picked up by Vasher. He's got a great knack for knowing where the football's going to be, getting his body there, putting his hands on the ball, stealing it, and running the other way. In 2005, Vasher found other ways to score. Low kick, Vasher drifts back. Vasher's gonna retrieve it in the end zone. Now he's gonna run it out. Thought about taking a knee. He's out to the 10. Vasher spinning away from a tackle. Now running right to the 15. He's got blocking help at the 20. Vasher to the 25, 30. Vasher to the 40. Vasher to midfield. Vasher to the 40. Vasher to the 30 of the Niners. Vasher on his feet at the 15. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. Nathan Vasher goes coast to coast. Vasher made the Pro Bowl in 2005. The last Bear cornerback to accomplish that feat was Donnell Wolford, who made the Pro Bowl in 1993. Looking around, steps up again, flies it over the middle. Donnell Wolford, for a year or two, was as good as it got in the NFL. Wolford played eight seasons in Chicago and led the team in interceptions four times. He currently sits at third place on Chicago's all-time interception list. Cornerback J.C. Caroline made the Pro Bowl in his rookie year in 1956 after he intercepted six passes. One of those interceptions was thrown by another historic rookie. We went to play the Chicago Bears. John came in for his first NFL live action. And then he fired one in out in the right flat and it was complete for a 56-yard touchdown to J.C. Caroline, who happened to be the Chicago Bears defensive back. J.C. Caroline intercepts this one. And here he is bringing the ball back. And uh, that was his first completed pass. In 1963, Caroline's role on the team changed, thanks to second-year player Benny McRae, number 26. Benny McRae took over for J.C. Caroline. I remember when he won the job, an exhibition game in Washington, the Redskins had Bobby Mitchell, and they must have thrown the ball to him about 13, 14 times because he was against this, this kid, Benny McRae, and Benny shut him down. McRae played nine seasons for the Bears and had 27 interceptions. His six interceptions in 1963 were good for third best in the secondary. The other starting corner in 1963 was Dave Witzel, number 23. Dave Witzel was more guts than talent. Real tough, scrappy guy. You would talk to him before a game and say, uh, Dave, you're, you're, you're facing Max McGee this week. I got him in my pocket. You know, he would talk like that. Dave Whistle gambled a lot, had a lot of confidence in himself, but he, but he always came up with a big play. In the game that clinched the conference championship in 63, he made the key interception, I think, against Detroit. Whistle was the real uh, catalyst of, of the defense that year, throughout the year, because every great defense has a guy that's an interceptor and, and a guy that gambles and takes chances, and he was that guy. Witzo could afford to take chances due to the immense talent of the team's starting safeties. It's intercepted by Roosevelt Taylor. Looks like he's in the open. Roosevelt Taylor finished second on the team in 1963 with eight interceptions. But Taylor's prowess was not limited to just takeaways. Rosie Taylor intercepted passes and stuffed the run. I've heard people tell me that he was as good as anybody that played at the time, Willie Wood or any of these guys that became in a Hall of Famers. With the Eagles threatening late in the game, Rosie Taylor, number 24, took the steam out of them by intercepting a sneed pass on his four-yard line and returning at 96 yards for a touchdown. Taylor made first-team All-Pro and the Pro Bowl in 1963. 
and he was still the second best safety on his team. That leads us to the second member of our all-time Bears secondary, safety Richie Pettibone. Pettibone was a big guy for the time. He was about 6'3", 220, which would be big now for a safety. Pettibone could attack the line of scrimmage and cover. He was the first in a long line of Bears safeties who could knock you out or pick off a pass. It's in the end zone. Pettibone revolutionized the way the position is played. Richie Pettibone was the prototype of the strong safety. He's great, great strong safety, very smart guy. Pettibone made four Pro Bowls in his career and was named an NFL All-Pro in 1963. He ranked second on the Bears' all-time interception list with 37. The two men we chose to be starting cornerbacks on our all-time team are both Hall of Famers, George McAfee and Red Grange. Both players are more well-known for their offensive prowess, but both also ended up being stellar defensive players. In the mid-1920s, the name Red Grange was synonymous with football in the same way that Babe Ruth was synonymous with baseball. He was this enormous star, and he became an enormous star because of the media that was available that covered his games and that brought his games into Americans' consciousness everywhere. After wowing the nation during three All-American seasons at the University of Illinois, Red Grange decided to turn pro. Grange's career changed forever during one game in Chicago. In 1927, I went up for a pass and came down and caught my cleat in the sod and uh, I injured my knee. I didn't think I would ever play football again. Grange sat out a year of football to let his knee heal. He wanted to return to Chicago. Could he regain his speed? Chicago's owner did not waver. And uh, George Hallis was all for this. But when he did play, what he found in effect was uh, he became one of the great defensive backs in the history of the game. We were playing a game, and he wasn't starting. He was standing on the sideline, and Hallis said, whenever uh, we go on defense, right, I want you to go in. The New York crowd started chanting that they won Grange. They got him, came back, and returned an interception for a touchdown, and uh, so I'm sure that those New York fans were a little questioning as to why they wanted to see Grange that well. In 1933, the Bears played the Giants for the championship, and again, Grange put his imprint on history. The game had been a seesaw game throughout, and uh, the Bears were clinging to a narrow margin as, as the game wound down to the final seconds. The Giant quarterback uh, launches this pass back catches this uh, pass and has the giant center who's Mel Hine right behind him and there's only one uh, defender so this is going to be a, a victory uh, if this defender cannot do something now the problem uh, for this defender who is Red Grange is he realized that as soon as he hits the ball carrier the ball carrier is going to lateral over to uh, the man following him for New York uh, and he's going to be out of luck. I was the only one in front of the ball carrier and the goal, and uh, uh, Mel was right behind him, and I knew if I tackled him that he was going to lateral the ball to Mel, and I, instead of tackling him, I put my arms around him and, and uh, grabbed the ball and held the ball so he couldn't throw it. And that was about, I guess, about 10 seconds before the end of the game. Grange makes perhaps his, one of his great plays uh, of his entire career, and uh, the ball carry hits the ground about five seconds later, the whistle blows, and the game is over, and the Bears are champions. I still say it was the greatest football game that I ever saw or ever participated in. Tim Mara, uh, who was certainly the giant owner, said it was one of the greatest plays he had ever seen. Although he reached icon status in his own era, Grange himself had his own ideas on how he would like to be remembered. I like to be remembered that I was a good citizen. I never cheated anybody. I paid my taxes. I voted. And I took care of my family. And I was uh, honest. And uh, uh, that's the way I like to be remembered. I think that uh, if I'm remembered as a good, honest guy, that's the way I want it. 
Our other cornerback was also well known for his electrifying athletic ability. We had a back named George McAfee, and he was spectacular. As a running back, there may never have ever been one any more elusive than he was. He'd catch a punt or a running play, and he'd run for a touchdown. And they started to call him one play McAfee. And the greatest compliment Hallis said he could give Gail Sayers during the height of Sayers' career was that compare him with George McAfee. After the Eagles selected McAfee with the second pick in the 1940 draft, Hallis traded for him. In 1941, McAfee was named to the official All-NFL team. Because of commitments to the Navy, McAfee played only six full seasons. But in 75 games for Chicago, one play McAfee intercepted 25 passes. In the 1940 championship game, George McAfee intercepted a pass and returned it for a touchdown, as the Bears beat the Redskins 73 to nothing. A lot of people said it was the T-formation that did it. The T-formation didn't have anything to do with it. It was their defense that uh, intercepted eight passes, ran four of them back for touchdowns, and then scored after the other four interceptions. The Bears' historic win showed Hallis' gift for innovation. Offensively, he had enlisted the help of University of Chicago coach Clark Shaughnessy to bring back the T-formation. In 1951, Hallis hired Shaughnessy to help revolutionize the defense. Clark Shaughnessy didn't even have the title defensive coach. He wanted to be known as a technical advisor. He didn't get along with a lot of the other assistant coaches, including one of his assistants, a guy named George Allen. He didn't even talk much with Hallis. He was an independent operator, but he ran very complex defenses. When Hallis saw that those defenses were not working too effectively, Hallis gradually phased in Allen. Shaughnessy was on the staff into the 62 season, midway in the season when he saw that he was being phased out, he disappeared. In 1963, George Allen's defense allowed just 10 points per game, and the Bears finished the season with just one loss. In the NFL championship game, they forced Giants Hall of Fame quarterback Y.A. Tittle into the worst performance of his career. An interception by linebacker Larry Morris set up the Bears' first touchdown. Later, Morris got through on a blitz, hit Tittle low, and temporarily knocked him out of the game. I remember the quarterback that came in for him was a kid by the name of Glenn Griffey. I don't know where the hell he played college. And he came in, I think it was the first play, if you look at the films. I hit him low and Doug hit him high, and this guy went, ah, squealed like a pig. And I thought, oh boy, this is going to be a nice day. Until Tittle came back. Then we had to suit up again. The Giants led by three late in the third quarter. I said to Y.E. Tittle there, stay out, okay? You don't have to play anymore. We got him. They can't score on us. It was up to the Bears' defense. And again, the unit delivered. And it was a perfect situation, and Joe Fortunato called the defense, and he said, OB, watch for the screen. And he started dropping back. I flared out and put my left hand up, and the ball stayed in my hand, and uh, I got down to about the 11-yard line, which eventually turned out to be the winning touchdown. With 10 seconds left, Richie Pettibone grabbed Chicago's fifth interception of the day to clinch the victory. George Hallis won the championship, his last as head coach. George Allen, his defensive assistant, got the game ball. Next, the all-time great Bear linebackers. The first also played center, Hall of Famer Clyde Bulldog Turner. I suppose if they picked uh, an all-time Bear team, he'd probably be the he'd probably be the center. As a linebacker, he wasn't too far behind. Despite weighing over 230 pounds, he possessed halfback speed. In 1942, he led the league in interceptions with eight.
In five title games, he intercepted four passes. And in the 73 to nothing win in 1940, he returned one for a touchdown. Hall of Famer George Connor played eight seasons for the Bears. During that time, he was named All-NFL at three different positions. Bobby Lane's fumble is picked up by Chicago's George Connor. He lights out with nothing in front of him but the goal line and races 48 yards to score for the Bears. It was at linebacker that Connor made his biggest impact. He was known for having great instincts and was one of the first to read offensive keys to tip off whether the play was a pass or a run. In the history of the Chicago Bears, no position has a greater legacy than middle linebacker, a tradition that began with the great Bill George. George began his career as a middle guard. Bill George, in my estimation, was the finest football player that ever wore a football uniform. We could go into a 51 defense, Bill would get on the setter's nose, and beat him nine times out of 10. A champion wrestler in college, he quickly established himself as one of the league's best tacklers. In a 1954 game, George abandoned his three-point stance and dropped into pass coverage. The decision would forever transform defensive alignments. Shaughnessy and Hallis decided that Bill George was so good at dropping off the line from his middle guard position to, to occasionally cover a receiver that they decided to create the position of middle linebacker. And he became the first of the great bare middle linebackers. George thrived in his new role. He was a force against the run and the pass. He was the brains of the defense. He just had a, a, an uncanny knowledge of the game and my most vivid recollection of him was his battle of wits with John Unitas. They'd be staring across the line at each other. Unitas would be calling audibles and George would be changing defenses. George got the best of Unitas and many others throughout his 14-year career in Chicago. In 1974, he was elected to the Hall of Fame. 24 years later, another Bears middle linebacker was enshrined in Canton, Mike Singletary. When Singletary first arrived with the Bears, he hardly had the look of an all-time great. He was a heavier player when he first came into the league. He and Jim McMahon were the only two players my their rookie year who didn't finish the uh, mandatory 12-minute run on a timely basis, and Buddy Ryan was all over Singletary uh, about that. Mike changed. He lost weight. He was quicker, faster, and just was a, an outstanding middle linebacker. Mike was played to run as good as any middle linebacker ever played it. Hey, baby! We're going to be here all day! We're going to be here all day, baby! I like this kind of party! The ten-time Pro Bowl neutralized even the game's best running backs. Dickerson, the tail, backhand off Dickerson. Oh. He's hit by Singletary. Singletary. Mike Singletary was a guy who was not the most gifted guy in the world, did not have the prototype size, speed, dimensions that you look for. He couldn't play coverage. We didn't ask him to play coverage. He knew he couldn't play coverage. Despite his shortcomings, Singletary always seemed to be a difference maker on the field. His greatest contribution, though, may have been what he did off it. I never played with a, a person that was more mentally prepared, studied more film. Hey, man, look at here. You got to watch for that quick pass to the right side. The quick pass to the back, out of bound formation, or even if it's flop, look at him lifting up. If it's plop over there and Sterling Sharp is on the inside guy, you got to be on it. Singletary captained the Bears' famed 46 defense and was the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year in both 1985 and 1988. 
The man currently playing the middle is making his way up the list of the Bears' legendary middle linebackers. Six-time Pro Bowler, Brian Urlacher. I wish I was as mean as Dick Buckus and as smart as Mike Singletary. If I did, I'd be the best linebacker ever. But they're both great players, and I wish I, I just wish I had a little bit of both of them in me. But they're totally separate players because they, they, they went about the game different. I think I'm different than both of them. Urlacher is the fastest middle linebacker uh, the Bears have, have ever had. He was also the first player in franchise history to lead the team in tackles during his first four seasons. Nobody I've ever seen has gone sideline to sideline like Brian Urlacher. And his size and his speed and his athleticism, he's going to be most likely a Hall of Fame player. Winds up looking middle, and it's intercepted by Urlacher at the 10. That was, that was an unbelievable one-handed reach up high with your right hand. That's a heck of a play by Erlock to ignite the whole stadium. He's off the charts. Big, fast, strong. Since his arrival in 2000, the Bears have twice led the league in fewest points allowed. For the past six seasons, Erlacher has benefited from the outside linebacker play of Lance Briggs. Bears coming on the blitz. Manning throws right side caught. And the ball's out. Bears have it. To the 15, to the 10. It's Briggs to the 5. Sniffer and Joe. Touchdown. Briggs, in my opinion, every bit as good as Erlacher. Uh, Erl Erlacher would argue, uh, might argue that he's better. Five goes back to throw. In trouble. Gets it away. Picked up. This ball game is over. Lance Briggs, uh, all he does is make plays, and he makes them, them all over the field. Gets a hold of Favre, Favre gets it away though, wobbly pass, oh! Lance Briggs down the left sideline, there's your turnover! He's the perfect weak side linebacker in the Tampa 2 scheme, uh, because he's instinctive, he's fast, and he, he knows how to tackle. Briggs has made the Pro Bowl four times, and is the first linebacker in NFL history to return an interception for a touchdown in each of his first three seasons. For our all-time starting 11 defense, our two outside linebackers are two stars from the 1985 Super Bowl champion team, Otis Wilson and Wilbur Marshall. <laughs> Nothing Otis Wilson did was subtle. His hits were big and he talked a big game as well. Sometimes I'd kind of like, oh, I can't believe he said that. But Otis was uh, one of those that was good at backing it up. He could walk the walk and talk the talk, and if you can back up whatever you're saying, then it, it's not trash talking, it's fact. Hell no, that ain't good enough. In 1985, Wilson recorded a career best 10 and a half sacks. Opposing quarterbacks might not remember his hits, but 20 years later, his teammates still do. Otis hit him blindside so hard that someone found his tooth on the astral turf. Yeah, players may lose a tooth here or there, but it wasn't a front tooth. It was one of his back teeth that got knocked out. You gotta play this game at one level. You cannot play it passive, you cannot play it, you know, with, with that, how do you say, that Holy Spirit, well, well, I'm gonna take it easy on this guy, or you get your head handed to you. Wilson's partner on the outside was Wilbur Marshall. If you ask our own defensive players who they were most, not afraid of, but didn't want to get on the wrong side of this guy, it'd be Wilbur Marshall. I mean, he had all the speed in the world and just a great athletic body, and he was mean. Wilbur Boutier Marshall was one mean SOB on our defense. In 1985, Marshall's victims were many, but none had it worse than the quarterbacks on the Detroit Lions. It was just the last game of the season, and we just wanted to play the game, but make a statement, and at the same time, get out of it healthy. Lions quarterback Eric Hippel survived the onslaught and finished the game. The quarterback Hippel replaced 
wasn't as lucky. For whatever reason, uh, Buddy called the blitz, and Wilbur Marshall took off. And Joe Ferguson, I don't think, ever saw him. Marshall, Marshall was, uh, man, was he, I mean, I mean, I can still see the lick he put on Joe Ferguson out in Detroit. I'd never seen him like it. I thought he killed him. Thirty years before Wilson and Marshall, the Bears' standout outside linebacker was Joe Fortunato. Fortunato played 12 seasons with the Bears and made the Pro Bowl five times. In 1966, his final season, he returned a fumble for a touchdown. 1966 marked the first season for another of the Bears linebackers, Doug Buffon. And the strong side linebacker is the linebacker spot I play. That's the garbage guy. He takes the beat. He goes in there, gets no credit for anything, just goes in there, gets his brains beat in. Buffon played 14 years with the Bears gathered over 1,200 tackles and recorded 24 interceptions. The records, when I played, you know, they didn't keep them, but I had 18 sacks one year. Despite his exploits, Buffon never made the Pro Bowl, primarily because he was overshadowed by the man who played next to him. The Bears have had many great middle linebackers, but only one can make our all-time starting 11, Dick Butkus. Butkus revolutionized the way defense was played from the moment he arrived. The first year that he began to play, he began to do things to runners that no one had ever done before. In that he was uh, tackling these guys with one hand and stripping them with the other, stripping them of the ball. I've never seen any linebacker in professional football who did this. Butkus recovered a near record 25 fumbles. And if records were kept for fumbles forced, he might very well be the all time leader. Dick Butkus was huge. I mean, Dick Butkus was the biggest middle linebacker any of us had ever seen. At six foot three and 245 pounds, Butkus treated opponents like rag dolls. I want to just let them know that they've been hit. And when they get up, they don't have to look to see who was, uh, that hit them. I don't go to the movies too often, but uh, one particular movie that stands out in mind uh, it was uh, with Betty Davis. I think it was Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. I got a kind of a charge when that head come rolling down the stairs. I kind of like to project those things happening on a football field and not to me. You had the feeling that he was serious that it wasn't just a game. That when he wanted to drill you, he really wanted to drill you and probably would want to drill you when the game was over. From his personality to the impact of his tackles, Butkus always left a violent impression. training room after we played the Bears than any other opponent. Everybody was bleeding, bruised, marked up. I remember looking at one of our assistant trainers. I said, was it that tough out there? And he looked at me and he said, Butkus. And he was verbally abusive too. 
when I was a rookie, he said something to me one time, and it it, is, it hurt my feelings, and it's 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 bothered me all these years. I'm thinking, wow, that was really a mean thing to say. <laughs> you know, Dick, you you really were you weren't a nice guy. <laughs> Butkus dominated a game the way no other player ever has. He dominated officials. He'd take the ball away from the guy after the play and shake it in the official's face, and the official would point it their way. It was awesome. He had an intimidating way about him. He also had a way of being in the right place at the right time. He was there many times before the blockers were ready and did a lot of what he did, not only because he had the physical attributes, but I think he had a great instinct. He was one of the most instinctive football players I think uh, I've seen on the other side. I would just look into the huddle and, uh, and read their lips or whatever, because uh, like Joe Cap, you could hear the play. And every quarterback would say, you know, okay, red, right, uh, 48, uh, sweep on two. Make sure everybody heard it, including us. For Dick to run a 100-yard dash, it take me three days. But I want to tell you something from that middle linebacker. 20 yards this way, 20 yards that way, 20 yards that way. I mean, nobody, nobody was quicker than he was. In his nine-year career, Butkus recorded a surprisingly high 22 interceptions. But in 1970, he was slowed down by a serious knee injury and never fully recovered. I always think of him when I think of Mickey Mantle. If both of them had had healthy legs. As great as they were, they would have been even greater. He played three seasons on a bum knee, with his finest performance coming in the 1971 season opener, the first Bears game ever played at Soldier Field. On the Saturday before the game, they were playing Pittsburgh. The story was out, his knee was so bad, that he was not going to be able to play. So we went to the game that, that Sunday and just expected someone to replace him, and he was out there. He not only was out there, the Bears fell behind by a couple of touchdowns. He turned the game around. Butkus intercepted Terry Bradshaw two times. A third was called back by a Bears penalty. Down by five in the final minutes, he forced a fumble that led to the game-winning touchdown. There's nobody, no one, as tough as Dick Buckus. Nobody. So there it is, our starting 11. Although some of the members of our all-time team might be up for debate, what cannot be questioned is the rich tradition of defensive football that has symbolized the Bears and the city of Chicago for over 80 years. 80 years old, it would take another 80 years to change it. Offense doesn't work here come December 21st, so you can always rely on defense. 